Good morning, Candy View. We're glad you're with us today. We invite you to worship with us wherever you're at. The Lord wants to meet you where you're at, wherever you're with. Just get into a posture to receive and to worship Him this morning. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this place, wherever we're watching. May your presence be felt. May your voice be heard. We need you, God. So let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven, fill our hearts with your light, cause we are here for you, we are here for you, sing to you our hearts are open, to you our hearts are open. Nothing here is it in you, our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God. Let your fire fall down. Let us shout. Let us shout. Be your anthem. Glory now, fill the sky, cause we are here for you, we are here for you, and let your word move in power, let what's dead, let it come to life. We are here for you. Oh, we are here for you. Oh, to you. To you, our hearts are open. Nothing here is it in you. Our one desire. Let your fire fall down to you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is it in. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy, God. Let your fire fall down. Devotion, 
You are worthy of our praise. We welcome. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. As I search the world, It couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, treasures the faith that never enough. You came along and put me back together. Now every desire. Is not satisfied here in your love. Cause there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. I know it's true See, I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Oh, you've seen them all And you still call me friend Because the God of the mountain God of the valley There's not a place For your mercy and grace That won't find me again Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing
to our knees. You turn seas into our ways. You're the only one who cares. You turn the only one, Lord, that can take our sin, take our shame, take our past, and throw it away. And in its place, a heart transformed, a life transformed, with a new hope. And it's all because of you. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you turn our graves into something vibrant and alive, something full of promise and hope. We worship you for that today. Everybody said, amen. Hey, I'm going to stick with you guys for a little bit and uh, welcome you guys for today's service. It's so good to be with you. My name's Tim Brown. I'm the worship pastor here at Canyon View, and it's so good to see you guys online joining us today. There's a big thing happening in a couple weeks, and you know it, and I know it. April 3rd and 4th is Easter weekend at Caney View, and we've been branding it as Easter for everyone because we want everyone to enjoy uh, the celebration that is Easter, and we want everyone to have a space, and so we're adding extra services for that. Uh, You'll see on our Facebook pages that there's events uh, available for you to not even register, but make sure that you're interested and say which one we're going to. It helps us on the back end to know what we need to provide as far as the service elements, how many children's workers we need, how many um, ushers we need, how many uh, people on hand we need to make each service memorable and awesome for you guys. So go ahead and go to Facebook, and you'll see an events uh, tab there and uh, select which service you're going to. We have Saturday night at 6 p.m. We have Sunday at 8, 9.30, and 11. That's April 3rd and the 4th. And we hope that you make it for one of those. We have plenty of space here for all of you that would like to come in person. We have four different opportunities here in the main auditorium to uh, celebrate with you. We'll also have a viewing of our Easter service online uh, for Saturday as well as Sunday. So if you want to join in with other people uh, online, we will have a service uh, party available for that as well. So we hope you don't miss out. And here's the thing with Easter for everyone. Everyone is invited, and everyone is invited to invite other people. And so wherever you're watching from, wherever you're coming, whether it's Saturday or one of our three Sunday services, invite a friend. And we encourage you to do so. You'll find a link at the top of this video uh, with uh, ways to easily invite people and show people where you're going for Easter service, when you're going to Easter service. And this is just an awesome time for people to see the life that comes with following Jesus. And we want uh, so much uh, new people here, so many people experiencing who Jesus is. Not necessarily what Candy View is, but who Jesus is. And so we'd encourage you to invite a friend because on the 7th, we have a big worship and baptism night immediately following Easter. So we'll have all of our new friends and people that have been here with us for some time uh, here at Canyon View uh, at our Easter service Saturday night and our Easter services Sunday morning. And then we will have an ask if anybody wants to get baptized or get saved or rededicated. And we're hoping for many, many people to make that decision Easter weekend. And so we'll be celebrating that in the main auditorium on Wednesday night after Easter, April 7th, uh, in the main auditorium for a big worship night and baptisms and just celebrating what God did over Easter weekend. So we hope that you join us for those. And so uh, there's also some awesome opportunities for you to partner with us at Canyon View. You can give in a number of ways. There is a link up top to show you how to do that. You can mail your check. You can uh, 
text, or you can meet us online and pay uh, your tithe in that way as well. We're so thankful for those of you that give week in and week out, making services like this possible, as well as opportunities uh, to bless our city like we will be doing for Easter as well. And so you're here for the middle of our road trip series, and Pastor Kirk has an awesome message for you. Check out this video. Suffering reminds us that pain is temporary, but God's kingdom is eternal. No matter how rough the trip gets, we have a Heavenly Father that never lets go of us. Well, welcome all of you that are watching our Canyon View Vineyard Church uh, service online, and it's an honor to be here with you today. And my name is Kirk Yamaguchi, and I'm co-senior pastor with Pastor Corey Sandro. And uh, this week on our road trip series, we're going to talk about what I titled The Anatomy of Suffering. This isn't a topic that is real popular to talk about, actually. <laughs> But I think as a, as a pastor, it's very important that we help one another to really understand and process this issue of suffering. And how do we negotiate our life when suffering comes into our midst? And I have to admit that there's, you know, there's no simple, trite, formulaic kind of... Uh, statement that I can give that will solve all of our issues about suffering. It's really way more complex than that. But I really do believe that when we use uh, what God gives us in the scriptures, he gives us some deeper understandings about this issue of suffering, and it helps us to, I think, be more resilient, to be able to withstand the the storms of life that come our way. Because um, over the years, man, I've seen so many people and have discussions with them that their their faith really gets derailed because suffering comes into their life. And when they don't have a, I think, a good theological framework to understand um, the anatomy of suffering, they tend to just kind of give up. And, you know, I think it's very possible that you or I know myself, we've come to that point in our life and in our walk uh, journey with trying to follow Jesus, wherever we're at with that, that we cry out, why? Why, God? Or we come to this point, uh, the end of the rope, and we just go, God, where are you? And I got to say, if if you haven't been there yet, just hold on, because you're probably going to get there. But I hope today's message will give you some extra tools in your tool belt, shall we say, to help you to stand firm and to be able to actually grow in your faith through suffering. Now, one of the things that we have to understand, this is kind of the framework that uh, I think is really important for us to establish, is in our life, in this world today that we live in, that we're living in the tension of the here and the not yet of the kingdom of God. And what that means is Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God into the world, but we're still living in the midst of the kingdom of darkness, And so we're caught in this tension of a clash of these two kingdoms. And we have to learn how to sort of have grace to work through that. And the Apostle Paul even talks about this in Ephesians 6. Look at what he says. He says, put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. And then he goes on to say, your hand-to-hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities 
operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Because of this, you must wear all the armor that God provides so that you're protected as you confront the slanderer. For you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. And so God actually gives us what's called the armor of God to help us to withstand the schemes of the enemy in this tension of living within a dark world but still having the kingdom of God with us. And how do we stand victorious? And it seems kind of odd maybe to some of us. Why did the Apostle Paul put that in the Bible? I mean, haven't many of us heard that, wow, you follow Jesus and your life is supposed to be wonderful and you're never going to suffer anymore and it's just going to be this glorious, victorious life. But Paul gives us another picture that we're in the midst of a battle. We're in the midst of a war. And so that's why we are struggling with things like sickness, disease, coronavirus, tragic accidents, poverty, relational conf conflicts, and really bad Colorado Rockies teams. I mean, we all have to live within a broken and fallen world, but we have the hope of the kingdom of God in our midst. So, you know, I, uh, I think of other parts of the world and what many people are experiencing today, and it, it's really quite disheartening when I really think about it. And I want to show you a picture here. This is a picture in Myanmar. And uh, a few weeks ago, there was a military coup in Myanmar, and the military government took over their democratic uh, government, and they are literally killing, arresting and killing young men. That would be a threat to them. And uh, I use this picture because it, it kind of covers up the, how graphic this is, but this man is carrying a young man who is obviously mortally wounded. And I've seen other pictures that uh, just take your breath away. And it makes me think of, we have uh, helped 72 wonderful Burmese church planters. We've, we've given them the resources so that they can go into their villages to plant churches. And that picture is a picture of what these guys are facing now. So these are godly men and women that are laying down their lives and now they're living in the midst of a literal genocide. And then I think of those eight Asian women in Atlanta on Tuesday that a gunman just came into their massage parlors and brutally murdered them. How do we explain that? What, what is going on in the world? And so in, in the midst of this, I am quite aware that there are so many stories that are in this room and so many stories of you that are watching in line that suffering comes in so many different shapes and colors and sizes, and it's real to every person. And so in this issue of suffering, I think it's important that we just start with prayer. So, Lord, as we come before you, and God, we're just trying to gain some insights and understanding that would help us to stand firm and to hold on to you as the suffering comes into our lives. We have individual suffering. We have suffering in families. Lord, we have corporate and we have national and international suffering. And God, we need you more than ever. And so, Lord, help us. Give us understanding. And for those that are in the midst right now of a 
tremendous tsunami of life, I pray, Lord, that your grace and mercy would lift them up and that through this message that we all would gain understanding that would give us strength, give us fortitude, and Lord, help us to hang in there and even thrive in the midst of the suffering. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, there is a great issue of the problem of suffering. That suffering is universal. What's happening in Myanmar is happening in other parts of the, of the world, like there are um, Nigeria in Africa and the South Sudan and Ethiopia. There's just places all over the world that we're seeing tremendous suffering and we all have our individual battles that we're fighting and the the challenge for us is even as a pastor I have seen the most godly people have to face horrendous suffering and uh, the thing that came to my mind is 25 years ago just on Tuesday, my mother-in-law and Jane and her sisters, they kind of were memorizing that it was 25 years ago that my father-in-law, Herb, died of a brain tumor. And uh, so here's Jane's mom and her dad, an incredibly godly couple, just loved the Lord, read the scriptures, went to church, Her dad was uh, an elder on the church board, and at 63 years old, a year younger than I am now, the Lord took his life through a brain tumor. And so here I'm seeing Marcy, Jane's mom, who to me is one of the godliest women I have ever met. And why did God take her husband and Herb, a man that... Uh, just incredibly devout to the Lord with a humble, very loving heart. Why did he die at what's, what's then seemingly such a young age, especially now when I'm 64 and look at, he died at 63. Man, he was really young when he died. But why does that happen to good people? And then on the other hand, I see people that are seemingly just ruthless evil, totally self-absorbed and manipulative. And they have what seems like everything. They got all the riches of the world and they live in this luxurious life and it seems like they have it all. How do you explain that? And admittedly, there's no simple question or answers to this question. And so I, I admittedly, I'm treading lightly at this. But as we move forward, I want to make a point that we need to really embrace today. Here's the point. One size doesn't fit all. There's not one trite, formulaic thing I can say that would go, oh, okay, now we understand why we have suffering and now we know what to do. It's not that simple. There are just volumes of books written about the problem of suffering. But I'm going to address a couple of things that I think we need to take an honest look at. And some of these things may be difficult for some of us to absorb. And the first one especially. And what I see from the scriptures, mind you, okay, so don't shoot the messenger, all right? But this is what I see in the scriptures. Suffering as retributive. And Retribution means the wrath or the judgment of God. And so, basically what I'm saying here is that suffering can oftentimes be the result of God's judgment on our sin, on our rebellion. Because God is a holy and righteous God. Get this. So if God is holy and righteous, it means that sin has to be dealt with. It has to be. 
because he's holy and righteous. And the best way I can think of d- describing this is uh, if I went into a bank and I pulled out a revolver and I said, give me all your money. And I robbed that bank and I escaped, but I get caught. What's going to happen is I'm going to go to court and they're going to put me on trial and they will have a jury and they, from the evidence they will say he's guilty as charged and they'll put me in a federal prison for a number of years. That is what happens in a just system that when someone breaks the law, they're giving a punishment that's equal to the crime that's committed. But uh, in the Old Testament, what we see is that there are multiple examples of God's retribution. We see this ultimately in the beginning, in original sin, in Genesis 3, verse 16. Look at this. It says, this is after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. It says, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. And I would add, if I was writing the Bible, and you will have to wait in long lines at restrooms. And then it says, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, so the men don't get off the hook. He said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Interesting, isn't it? Because of their rebellion, because of their sin of Adam and Eve, original sin brought in the curse of sin over all of creation. And so because of that, what we see and what we experience is because of the fall of man, we face sickness, we face coronavirus, we face disease, natural disasters, pestilence, war. You name the struggle. It all started at original sin. Now, this causes big problems for us because because of man's rebellion and because of our desire to control our lives and not allow God to control it, we make decisions that bring God's retribution over us. It's just sometimes a natural consequence to it. The Lord talks about this in Deuteronomy 28, 15. So, but if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. So the Lord is saying, hey, if you choose not to follow the law, then you're going to bring curses on yourself. Now, I, uh, I, you know, I question this kind of theology because God's a God of grace. And because of grace, we kind of have a license to sin. But I have seen firsthand this principle lived out. Now, what happened was years ago when we were a few years into our church plant in Canyon City, the, the church was doing really well, and, um, but we were at that point where the church was growing. And so there was a guy in our church at that time that was disgruntled with me, really, and uh, so he started going around and talking to people individually. And the church wasn't real big, so it didn't take him very long. And he got together, this group of about eight people. And uh, they put together this little booklet of things that they were saying and accusing Jane and I of. And it was just unbelievably outlandish, the things they were saying. One was one woman, she was supposedly a prophetess, and she said the Lord had showed her, showed her that I was having an affair with my next-door neighbor. 
And uh, I'm thinking, have you seen my next door neighbor? <laughs> She's like 20 years older than me. Like, I don't think so. And, uh, and then they were saying that we were using church money to do an addition on our house because we enclosed our patio and made it into like a sunroom. And um, it was unbelievable the things that they were accusing of us. And they asked the elders to be in the meeting with us. And uh, one of the elders, God bless Dave, he finally stood up and he says, this is heresy. You guys get out of here and we don't want to hear any more of this. So they leave. And man, Jane was mad. Woo! You should have seen her hitting our, our punching bag in our garage after this. But uh, what, what happened after this? is two of those couples got divorced. Uh, two of those families had young boys in their families. All of those young boys rebelled and just went nuts. One of the guys had a heart attack and died. And then one of the women just went on this total manic episode with mental illness. Now, was this just a consequence? I don't know. I... But for me, it was like it put the fear of God in me. Like, if God can do that for people that attacked us erroneously, I need to be certain that I bless and not curse others. Boy, that was a huge lesson for me. So I think at times our suffering can be God's retribution. But I also see that suffering can be because of discipline. Suffering as discipline. Now, this is kind of a close cousin to what we saw on God's retribution. But what I see is God is a loving father. And a loving father, because of that love, disciplines his children to help them to mature and to grow up. And I I have faced God's discipline in my life so many times. But we see this in Hebrews 12, starting in verse 5. It says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So, any loving father... He's going to discipline his children because he wants his children to learn and he wants them to grow and mature and learn how to make good decisions. And uh, our daughter, Gertie, she's 21 now, and she calls it adulting. (laughs) She says adulting isn't very fun because she's had to learn from hard kind of consequences that she has to start making good choices, and she's doing very well with that. But uh, when we've been raising our kids, we try to raise them with uh, what's called uh, natural and logical consequences. It's called love and logic. And uh, so one of the things that we teach our kids is the things, the choices that you uh, make will bring on your consequences on yourself. But the thing is, is you have to follow through as a parent. And you have to make sure that they have to endure the discipline that you said would happen. And one of the things that Jane would pray with our kids, and this is a, for any of you that are younger, this is a dangerous prayer that your parents are going to pray. <laughs> and Jane would pray, Lord, bring to light what our kids are doing in darkness. And God always answered that prayer. And in Matthew 10, 26, Jesus talks about this himself. He says, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, are hidden 
that will not be known. Meaning what you do in darkness, the Lord is going to bring it to light. And he does that because he loves us and he wants to bring his discipline into our life so that we can change, so that we can become the godly people that he wants us to become. But when we don't understand this principle, what can happen when we are bringing God's discipline on ourselves? is we can blame God. We can judge God. We can even curse God, but we're the ones that's a problem. So what do we do? I love what the Apostle James said in his letter, in James 1, 2. He said, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So what he's saying here is God uses his discipline to grow our hearts and our souls so we become mature spiritually. And that's where we come into a place of finding our completeness in Christ. That's the goal. And that's where we come to a place of lacking nothing in our soul. Not materially, but in our soul. But here's another thing that I think about suffering. Another lesson for us is suffering teaches us patience. I don't know about you, but maybe you've prayed this prayer. prayer. (laughs) Lord, Give me patience and give it to me now. But how in the world do we develop patience? I, um, just a couple of days ago, my grandson Noah turned six years old. And so they were going to have a birthday party for him on that day. And he woke up at 1230 in the morning. And he went up into Wade and Chelsea's bedroom, woke them up. Is it time for my birthday? They said, no, Noah, go back to bed. It's only 12.30. He comes up at 2.30 in the morning, fully dressed. And he goes, is it time for my birthday? So that is such a great picture of a young boy that was so excited, but he needed some more patience to wait until his birthday party. But isn't that how we feel oftentimes with the Lord? Lord, is it time When is this coronavirus thing going to end, Lord? Lord, when is this sickness going to end? When are these financial challenges going to end, Lord? But the Lord uses many of those trials and those struggles and the suffering in our life because he's teaching us godly patience. He's teaching us endurance. And I think of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 7, look at this. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. This is Apostle Paul talking. A messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That is a powerful statement. I want to read that again. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So then he comes to the conclusion. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What was Paul's thorn? Theologians debate about this. We don't really know. But the important thing is, is God didn't take it away. God used it to keep Paul humble. And God will put thorns in our lives to keep all of us humble. And that's the one thing is uh, when we 
get conceited or our pride begins to rise up, be ready because the Lord is probably going to bring his discipline to humble us. But what we see in our weakness is that's when we lean on God's strength and not ours. That only happens many times, friends, unfortunately, through suffering. So what do we do about this problem of suffering? I think it's really important that we take a moment of diagnosing our suffering. I've gone to a physical therapist here in town, and he told me that what he does is he gets to the root of the problem. Because if you just treat the symptoms, it's not going to take away the pain. And so he would do his manipulations and movements, and what he was doing was getting to the core issue that was causing the pain in my body, and after a couple treatments, the pain was gone. It was really unbelievable to see the results of what he did. And uh, it just reminded me of what a, a pastor friend of mine said years ago. And I never forgot this. He said suffering is the result of one of three things, or maybe a combination. But it's the result of the fall, okay? Original sin, like we talked about. Or it's the devil that's bringing our suffering in our life. Or it's because of ourselves. It's because of our boneheaded things that we do, or say, or think, or believe, that brings our own suffering on us. Sometimes the enemy doesn't need to do anything because he says, that, that guy is a lost case. Let him go because <laughs> he's bringing the suffering on, him, on ourselves. So taking some time to have an honest assessment in our lives, I think we can ask three critical questions that are going to help us. The first question is, did I cause this? Meaning, did my a rebellion, is my pride, is my uh, selfishness, is it bringing these consequences on me? Is this God's retribution to me? Or is it God's discipline? Because when we do that and take an honest assessment, then we realize, I have found the enemy, and the enemy is me. And then we ask God for the grace to help us to change. So, did I cause this? The second thing, is this the result of living in a broken and fallen world? And so, we can't really blame a particular person, but it's a result of living in a broken, fallen world. If you have cancer, do I have cancer because of my sin? You have cancer because of the sinful fallen world. There are certain things that happen to us because of living in a world that is still ravaged by the results of Adam and Eve's original sin. And it won't be resolved until we either die and go to heaven, or Christ returns and sets up his eternal kingdom. And the third thing, the third question Is this a test? Is God using this to teach me something? As a loving father, is he teaching me patience? Is he teaching me how to be humble? Is he giving me wisdom through this? Is he giving me empathy so I can help another person down the road that may be suffering from the same thing? So, before we go further we have to take an honest assessment of those three questions so that we can, in a sense, grow through our suffering instead of the suffering derailing us from our faith. God's love and understanding of our pain and suffering comes from him facing the same things himself. We see these in Hebrews 4. In verse 15, talking about Christ. For we do not have a high priest, meaning Jesus, 
who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hmm. What's that saying is Jesus has experienced the same things we have, done, have experienced, but he hasn't sinned in the midst of it. And take great comfort in knowing that he empathizes with our pain, with our suffering. Suffering. I had a brother who told us uh, that he was driving home the other day from work and he was having a conversation with the Lord. Have you ever had one of those conversations with the Lord? <laughs> and he was just pouring his heart out, his frustrations, his angers, and, and uh, his impatience. And it was in that that he found God. God met him there, and God gave him peace. And so, I just have, going back to 25 years ago, when Jane's father died, we had the funeral, it was a wonderful funeral, and then the family and some other friends, close friends, went to the gravesite. And they had the gravesite service, and I had the honor of just standing next to my mother-in-law, Marcy, and Jane and her sisters were all there. And Jane, Jane's mom, Marcy, is right here in front of the casket. The service ended, and everyone's leaving. And Marcy, just very calmly, she just speaks out. And it was one of those moments that I felt like the Lord prompted me and he said, Kirk, pay attention. You're going to learn something here. And so I'm standing there with Marcy, and she's not crying, she's not losing it, and with this incredible peace and resolve, she says, I'll see you in heaven, Herb. And she turns around and she walks to the car. And I was just speechless. And to me, that was a picture of a woman who understood God in the midst of her suffering. Because she knew it was temporal. And she knew that she had that hope, that eternal hope that she too one day would meet Herb at heaven's gate in that day that the Lord calls her home. She knew that this wasn't the end. And so for the last 25 years after Herb's absence, Marcy has continued to live. She's continued to thrive by loving her four daughters. She even loves her four son-in-laws, <laughs> myself included. She loves her 13 grandchildren. And now she loves her three great-grandchildren. She does it with incredible grace and love and peace. And it's because she leaned on Jesus in the hope of eternity in the midst of her suffering. And so I, I think of Romans 8, verse 18. And what I want to do is I want, if you... For those of you that are watching online, even in your living room or in your car, don't do it in your car, because <laughs> you got to keep your eyes open. But if you can, I want you to close your eyes. And as I read this scripture, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit speaks to you and brings comfort to you. So close your eyes if you can. And Holy Spirit, come and speak and bring comfort through your word today, to all of us. Romans 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with 
eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees but if we hope for what we do not see we wait for it with patience and so my friends i pray that these words would bring great comfort to you as we face the various kinds of sufferings in our life we know that god is going to bring our redemption, and God is working His uh, salvation and life within our hearts. And so, Lord, we come before you now. And some of you watching online, when I talked about God's retribution, it's very possible that God was speaking to you at that moment. And God's saying to you, it's time for you to give up your life to me. And so I just encourage you and invite you to pray with me. Lord, forgive me that I have lived my life in rebellion against you. And God, I choose now to turn my life around and start to follow you. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the wisdom and understanding of how to live my life in following your will so that my life can obtain the richness and the fullness that you desire me to have. Amen. And for those of you out there that you have already prayed and asked Jesus into your life, I just pray, Lord, that you would give us all comfort, give us understanding, and Lord, give us strength and peace to be able to endure and to be resilient and to stand firm till the end because we know that you are in control. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for hearing us out. And remember, hold on to Jesus in the midst of our suffering because that's what we have that will last eternally. God bless you. Lord, I come I confess Bowing here I find my rest And without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you you're my one defense my righteousness oh God I need you sin runs deep sin runs deep 
your grace is more what grace is found is where you are and where you are lord i am free holiness is christ in me lord i need you My righteousness, oh God, I need you. So teach my soul to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. But Jesus, you're my hope. Hey, oh Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, Lord, I need you. You're my one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God. My righteousness, oh God, I need.